What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Hit that subscribe button, hit the like button. Go ahead, hit that like, give you a second. Make sure you share the video, leave a comment. I think we got a pretty good video today. We're going to have a good interview. Um, I know some of you guys were bugging out about the dude the other day, so we got to step it back up, man. We had Evil Bill, Aryan Devil, but we're changing, we're changing pace right now. But I'm going to bring a brother on that's from Ohio, spent a lot of time in federal prison, a lot of time in state prison, but he can tell you his story better than I can. Brian, tell the people who you are, where you're from, and talk a little bit about your life, man. What's going on, Chad, man? I just want to say, first of all, it's an honor to be on here. My name's Brian. Uh, I clicked on your program by my, my girl set up some YouTube TV and stuff, and I seen that. I clicked on it, and I just, since then, man, I, like I told you, you know, every morning it's I'll start my morning with my coffee before I go to work at the end of the day, you know, sometimes even during the day, you know, and uh, I just really just felt like a, like, I don't know, like, man, like just, I wanted to just like, yeah, you know, somebody saying what's not been said, you know, because a lot of the real ones like us, we don't want to talk, but it's, it's, you know, it's taboo, you know, you don't want to say nothing, you know, and unfortunately that's the reason why things are probably the way they are. You know, the guys that do want to talk, they unfortunately just want to get other guys in trouble instead of the system that's so corrupt and putting us in these pits in the first place you know but uh i mean i don't know what do you, i started out at 19 uh, i was federally indicted i had a uh i'd had a state case with me and a buddy had been pulled over with a little pound of weed so i was out on bond for that and uh i knew the atf was looking at me for some things uh they'd stopped by a few places and left some cards i just got scared as a kid and uh, went on the run. Well, when I went on the run, that weed charge got dropped, but they charged me with failure to appear on a PR bond. They PR'd me on the weed, you know, and that became a felony. And then the feds indicted me for aiding and abetting someone who made false statements to a firearms dealer. I ended up going on the run, going back home where I'm from, Texas and everything. My grandpa and some other people talked to me, said, go home, you know, turn yourself in and uh, just do the time like a man. That's what I did. I come home, turn myself in thinking I'd probably get probation from the feds. You know, it was probation to 30 months. It was just aiding and abetting. They never found no guns or nothing. Well, they gave me 30 months, you know, and the state gave me a year. So I did my year for the state. And uh, I started, I believe it was 2005 in Richland Correctional Institution, man, in uh, Mansfield, Ohio. And uh, anybody who's ever been there in them years, you know, you know I was in three upper to 21 and under block, gladiator school or whatever. And uh Man, it was just, I mean, you fight as soon as you get there. I mean, you fight, it's just all day, every day. Wasn't a lot of stabbings, you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of locks and belts and stuff like that, but it wasn't like federal prison, like, you know, the USPs or even some of the FCIs I was at where they were hopping. Uh, this was just, 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 you know, brutal, glad you just, you know, hand to hand and, and, and always the white guys always getting jumped, you know, you're never getting a fair one on that, you know, and it's really city geographical sets and stuff like that. So uh, from there, after I finished that year, uh, I went to Cumberland, Maryland, man, and uh, I'll, okay, so let me stop this. I guess I, 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 I forgot to tell you a key thing. In 1998, I moved to Colorado Springs, Colorado. I had a pretty rough kind of, some people say rough childhood. My mom got custody of me and my sister when I was 12 and 98. We moved to Colorado Springs, and uh, the neighborhood that we were in, I just immediately just maybe out of a little bit of worry and wanting to be cool and everything, you know, I got into the gangs, and I became a full corner hustler in 1998, man, and uh, I want to say right now, that was just one of the worst mistakes I ever made, the gang thing, the gang decision. And, and it, it was a weak decision on my part. You know, I was a small dude, you know, not from that area. So kind of reaching out and it just it just snowballed. I caught a pistol case that year in 98 at 12 years old. I got caught with a police issued 38 special, you know. I mean, think about that. A 12-year-old boy with a 38 special in a gang. I mean, if it was my – I don't even have kids. And to think about, like, now as I'm 36 years old today, it just – it's, it's scary. You know, it scares me it's, it's to think that I would know someone like that. And that was me, you know, but, uh, got caught. I went, went to DYS for a little bit, like, you know, just like a month or something, 45 days, got out on probation. As soon as I finished that up, I get caught with another one, man. And at this time, there, uh, the man my mom was married to was in the army and they were getting ready to move back to Ohio, you know? So, uh, they were going to send me away for two years for this second pistol case. And, uh, I was going to have to stay there and be in juvenile and all that. It gets worked out to where I'm going to be on intense probation. They're sending me to Ohio. I can never turn to Colorado. So instead of taking my chance to run with it, I get to Ohio and the same thing, the need to feel like I need to impress everybody or be that tough, super tough guy came to Ohio with that gang stuff, the four corner hustler stuff, it snowballed, which led to me being indicted at 18, you know, 19 years old for all that crap. You know, I was already selling drugs and gang banging up here, guns and all, you know, the 
you know the life. So I want to talk. I want. I want to talk about you going to federal prison. You end up going to Cumberland, Maryland. That's a, a FCI. But you don't stay in Cumberland, do you? No, nah, I'm only in Cumberland for a quick minute, man. Like I said, so I'm a four corner hustler, and I really didn't know what that was. I just knew that was the neighborhood. You know, I knew who our enemies was. I knew all that. So I get there, and I'm in a the black TV room, which I didn't know they were watching uh, BET. So I'm in there as a young kid. I'm listening. I always grew up with rap and country music, man. That's just I love both of them. So I'm listening to the songs, and it was uh, some guys on there, and I didn't know the room's full of Crips or something or or some gang, I'm not exactly sure which one, but they said something about somebody being a blood or some one of them rappers. I said, no, he's a crip. So the guy turns around and old school black guy said, oh, you must be a loke. I said, no, I'm a four corner hustler. And everybody's room in the room's eyes got like, what did he just say? And they were like, what'd you, yeah. So they asked me a few questions and I just kicked what I knew, you know, from the guys I've been around, you know, and uh, come to find out them guys that I were around were way more official than I ever even knew as a little kid. They really did hold some weight, ended up saving me when I get to the USP. But so they go and get the Latin Kings and the Vice Lords and all these guys who I didn't even know were a part of what I was a part of, you know, and swore this out to and was entrenched in now. And they all come down there anyways. You know, they accept me as a brother. You know, they run my pay- check my paperwork, all this stuff, you know, and now I realize like this gang thing is serious in here, too. But. I noticed there's no white guys like I'm the only white guy and I never really was racist. So it just really didn't matter. I just didn't really notice that, you know, a whole lot race. And when I was young, it never played. I never noticed it. I guess I was never taught to be racist. I never grew up racist. I never knew. No- I mean, I had all my and my sister friends were black. We grew up. That's where we grew up. at. So and I like rap music and country music, you know, anyways, I meet the Kings. Some stuff ends up happening there in Maryland. Uh, there I get into a I get an assault charge. OK, some some. some some stupid shit happens, right? They take me and send me to a, it's a, a, just a simple assault, whatever, you know, uh, well, assault with a weapon, you know, regular shot, send me to a USP for that. Okay, so- Hold on, I want to stop you. I want to stop you because it was an assault. Was it on another gang member or another gang you guys no, were beefing with? I mean, that's why I probably didn't go into it because it's not much of a good story. It was a chomo, bro. These kings, all right, there's a chomo down the thing and he was playing, me and my one dude country turned out, he was hot as fuck, or excuse me, he was hot from uh chicago a black latin king uh anyways he uh this chomo i tried to play with me on the range while me and my dude were horse playing shouldn't have been doing it anyway but uh i took offense to it and they kept saying stuff to me well i went over to a cell blew in his cell slapped him told him hey man don't do none of that blah leave the next day when i come in from work dude was waiting on me with a razor you know what i'm saying so we get to scrap one with the razor cut up a little bit when i see i hit him i didn't realize it just broke his face. You know what I mean? It just, I mean, I don't know if he had an actual broke jaw, but it's just messed up. You know, I hit him hard. And then he got cut up too with his own weapon, but not on my doing. But you know, it didn't matter. We're all tangled up in this shot and they find the weapon. You know what I'm saying? They see he attacks me. Guess what? Guess what? You know what kind of yard Maryland is? He got back out, bro. Attack me with the weapon, Chomo, and gets back out. They sent me to a USP. Because when I went in there to talk to an investigator, she asked me what the problem was. And I tell her all the whole true story. You know, I tell her the whole true story, exactly what happened. And I said, you know, I like to think, I don't know what made me say this. The investigator was kind of a cute chick. I was trying to act tough. I was like, you know, I want my mom to know when she sees these chomos on TV, you know, she thinks they better not send him to a prison with Brian, you know. And she was like, oh, that. And she flipped on me. You know, they sent me to the pen. I thought I was, dude, I was 19, Chad. I mean, I was an idiot. I, I really, what you're doing is you're, you're trying to rap to the chick and act like, yo, fuck this dude. He's a chomo. <laughs> It's, you're, I mean, I want people to just hear you say that and think that you told on someone that ain't what happened. You were, you were oh, just, you were like trying to act cool and tough. This dude is a scumbag, and uh, yeah. and they're like, no, don't, they're like, don't worry, me. they're like, don't worry, Brian, we got something for you. And you know, one thing I noticed when you talk, man, you talk fast. So yeah. you, if you need, if you need some water, man, go ahead and get some. <laughs> so, so let me, so let me say that too. That's uh, so because people are seeing me on here, I've got anxiety and uh, PTSD from all this crap. Uh, Chad, now, man, I, I've always had a little. Brian, uh, we're gonna, Brian, we're gonna get into your story, but I want people to know that that isn't where your story ends. Your story changes, man. You end up, you know, an AB, an Aryan Brother member. You end up in some violent stuff. You see some violent stuff. You're in Polak when Gar kills the black dude that I put the video up about. Yeah. We're gonna talk about all that stuff as we go. So you leave, right, you leave Cumberland, and you end up where in Pollock? Yeah, Pollock USP, man, Pollock. Yeah, Pollock USP in two thousand and six, man. And uh, so, do you want me to tell you how that how that happened, or when I come into the USP? What yeah, let's go. Like? Let's talk about when you get to Pollock. I because... just came into the USP, and I let them know off top I'm a four corner hustler, which in the feds they ride under the vice lords, you know. And so, 
they bring all these guys. Well, what I didn't know at the time, the Vice was pretty much controlled that compound, man. They had all time big, all big names from Chicago and India, Gary, Indiana, and all these guys, right? And they're all black and they're, you know, all life sentence, everything. So I come in telling them that they're like, my telly's like, he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You sure you want me to go tell these guys that, bro? I'm like, man, this is what it is. Look at the side of my neck. And when I show them the side of my neck, it used to say 4CH, huge on the side of my neck. I got it when I was a kid. I earned my bones. I put it on the side of my neck. That was my, you know, which is now covered up with a three-leaf clover, as you can tell. But any which way, um, you know, so I show them the side of my neck. So they go and get the big dude, Nuke at the time, bring him down. From Chicago was ended up being a real good dude. We kick it, asks me a few questions. Sees I'm pretty official. The only thing is I'm white. So they run me out to the cheaper the four corner hustlers. <laughs> I mean, I'll never forget it. It was just the craziest thing. You know, he's looking at me. He's like, Charlie, do you know what the hell you saying, Joe? Because, you know, that's how he talk in Chicago, you know, and that's how PD talk. And he was just, I was like, yeah, man. And he asked me a few questions too, certain questions, you know, I told him to answer. He's like, all right, well, you know, I hope you got your paperwork. You know, I'm like, yeah, man, I got all that, you know, but anyways, as time goes, they embraced me fully and accepted me. Right. So you asked a guy on here the other day when the first time he saw somebody get killed, right, in the USP, right? And I thought about that. My, my girl asked me, like, you know, when was the first time you saw somebody get killed? And I thought about it for a second. And I was like, you know, it's so crazy because the first time I seen somebody get killed, <laughs> he lived. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's, it's like you think about that, like that shit don't make, it don't make sense, right? But this guy was literally had to be dead. There's no way. Like when I found out he lived, I never saw him again, but they said he lived. Did he, man? I don't know. I'm going to tell you who he was and what happened to him. These these dudes give me this care package, right? You know, about $100 worth of groceries. You got to slow down, man. You talk too fast. It's horrible, man. It's a curse, man. You know, that's why I smoke that medical marijuana and stuff. And I mean, I smoke it heavy and it barely slows. I just So I'm going to try to slow it down for you a little bit, man. Because, uh, all right, I want this to stick. This, these guys give me all these groceries and these stamps and everything. And, uh, my, my cellies from uh, Northern California, he says, hey, man, you want to set some of those books of stamps out, you know, set out two for three. So I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. So he says, here, I'll take you to meet the guy. His name's Nut. He's from Memphis. Good dude. Black dude. Great dude. So I meet Nut. Nut gets the books. He says, man, I'll probably have these back in a couple hours. Man, I'm going to send some money for some stamps. Da, da, da. You know, I'm like, all right, cool. No problem. You know, he takes off. Cheeseburger takes off. Everybody, you know. I'm sitting over on the steps. I go up the steps. And I'm just thinking how I'm in this place, man. I'm like, this is just the craziest shit I've ever, I've never seen nothing like this. I got a humongous knife on me to give me. I'm like, I, I've heard all the stories, you know, it's just crazy. I'm the only white guy in this, to this black gang. They're all black. I mean, they seem to be embracing me, but it's just, man, it's, it, it was a lot, you know, and all of a sudden it's the, the, they call them punks, you know, the fag or the whatever you want to call them. And the unit walks up to me, long hair, about six, six. I mean, built like just long ponytail and no facial hair and starts talking. He says, look, I'm not coming up to you to disrespect you or anything like that. I just want to let you know I do the laundry in the unit and I make candles. So I'm like, all right, that's cool. I'm really wanting this guy to get away from me. I'm young. I don't want people seeing me talk to this guy. I don't, you know. So about that time, we start hearing a crazy scream. Chad, just the most animalistic sounds you've ever heard in your life, man. I mean, just like just terror shrills of sh screeches of, of like and, and the, this. I'll never forget it. This punk turns around and says, oh, somebody's getting punished. And I was thinking, like, is this a rape? Those screams were so awful. I was like, what is going on? And I'm sitting at the, all of a sudden this cell door busts open. And this guy, nut, the guy just gave those two books of stamps to comes running out. But as his arms are running. Blood is just squirting past his arm. I mean, you see it coming out of it. It looks like he's throwing it as he's running. It's crazy, right? And he's running straight for the steps, right where I'm at, right? And I'm like, oh, my God. I mean, he's coming straight for me. So I, I get up off the steps, and I move over to the – got the big pillars. And I get behind one of those, and I peek out from behind there. And behind him, out of that cell comes two humongous black Muslims with these big beards and even bigger knives, Chad. I mean, they were – I mean, a bone crusher doesn't do justice to describe these weapons, man. I mean, you've seen what they what, what we make in there. It's just it should. Be, I mean, you can't even can't even believe the cutlery. I will call it cutlery. Man. I can't even believe this. These these weapons anyway. So and they're on him and they're you see the look of determination and grit in their faces. They're, they're going to get this guy, you know, and he's he, he's running for dear life. And uh, now they, he cuts and comes straight for the pole, Chad. They're coming straight for me again. Now, for some reason, I don't know how close you've ever been to someone just being viciously attacked just like that. I don't know. None of these people. I've done nothing wrong. I'm not hot. I'm solid. I've never done anything. My, my career's, you know, I'm, you know, no blemishes, right? 
And for whatever reason, I just thought that they would stop stabbing him and just start stabbing me because they were so close and they were just stabbing him, sinking that big metal into him. And it was just so, and I'll, I'll never forget when they ran by the pole, the one ran the nut and you smell the blood, you smell that coppery crappy smell. And then right behind him was the one Muslim and the other Muslim on that side. And I mean, they were so close to win. And I smelled that frankincense, man, that Muslim one. I smelled that mixed with that coppery blood smell, Chad. So those nuts still running, but they catch him, push him very hard. He smacked hard into the phone and drops down unconscious. The one Muslim leans over me, stabs him two times, leans up and the cops running up to him. He says, Hey, 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 turn to rise. What? And that cop jumped and ran, ran out of the unit. You know, I'll never forget this boy. Wiped the, wiped the blood off his knife, lifted up the lid on the ice machine, threw it in there. His partner came over there, threw his in there, and they walked out of that unit like nothing. All of a sudden, you know, attention, this is institutional emergency. Get on the ground or you will be shot. Body este mandaba, or they say in Spanish, and then they're locked down, locked down. Everybody locked down. They're coming into the units. Now here comes Cheeseburger off the yard. And he asked me, he says, now, Nuts, the guy Nut, is laying there from Memphis. He's just laying there. He's a body. This is the first, this is why I say it's the first time I seen somebody get killed with a knife in a penitentiary right in front of me like that. And uh, Chief Barrett, he says, man, what happened? And for some reason, I don't know why, it just made me so furious that he asked me that question, what happened? And I blew up. I said, look at him, he's fucking dead. What do you mean? What do you fucking mean? But, um, excuse my language. But that's what I was saying. I was so mad that he asked me that. And I don't know why, because he didn't know. He just come from the yard. But it was just, this man just got killed in front of me, man. So any which ways, you know, this is so sad what happened, why he ended up getting stabbed. Anyway, they say he lived. I don't know if he lived. If anybody was in Pollock in 06 when Nut got stabbed in A3, I mean, or, yeah, A3, you know, hey, did he live? I don't, I think he died, or I saw him get the last final after he'd already been, you know, and, and then he laid there for 10 minutes, Chad, before they got anybody to help him, you know, everybody locked down before any of the nurses come in and everything. So we're all so confused to why this happened to Nut, you know, why did this happen? So he's in a cell with an older nation of Islam, black. Okay, they're sellies. This guy drinks all day. The Nation of Islam guy gets drunk, sloppy, loses one of his knives. He asks Nut, hey, man, you see my knife, youngster? Nut's no, nah, it's cool, man. I ain't got your knife, man. You probably got drunk and lost it. <laughs> Leaves. Well, school did get drunk and lost it, but he also gets drunk and thinks that Nut stole the knife and goes out on the yard and tells some of his Muslim brothers what happened. Well, two guys who just don't want to be here no more, uh, we'll kill him, not a problem. So when Nut came in that day and opened that cell, those two Muslims were sitting on his bunk waiting on him with those knives and that frankincense rubbed all over him. And, you know, I imagine not saying, hey, what are y'all doing here? You know, <laughs> I mean, what, who, what did they say? Hey, we came to kill you, you know, but. Listen, you're in USP hey, Pollock. Now. You're in USP Pollock. I want people to I want that to resonate with the people where you said, hey, there's two guys here. that says, you know what? We don't even want to be on this compound, so we'll kill them. Tell them people actually do that type of stuff. Right. They'll kill you because they don't want to be at a prison. Right. Chad, it's so sad, bro. That's 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 actually one of the, you know, at least that's some of a reason, somewhat of a reason, you know. At least this guy's looking to get a transfer. Some guys are just pure evil. I mean, they just want the blood on their hands, or they just want to feel, hear that sucking sound, or feel what that, you know, that feeling that you feel when you, you know, take a man's life. It's just a horrible thing that that's what the agenda is in a United States penitentiary in the United States of America. In your United States of America, my United States of America, this is what's going on. So Pollock is known to be one of the most dangerous prisons in the country, right? I don't care, federal prison, state prison. USP Pollock was a place where people get killed on a regular basis. I think they had 11 murders in one year. Um, <clears throat> I had a guest on before that, that said that. Um, I'm not sure if that's 100%, but I heard that. I was there before. Definitely not a nice place. You also witness other acts of violence, right? You, you, you were there when Gar... Yeah, Stabbed the black they, DC dude, right? Yeah, I was there when they killed Bubba, man. I should say when Gar killed the black dude, but when they both lost their lives, man. And I, I heard you guys talking about it, and really that's why I reached out to you because, you know, at first I was just watching you. I never really imagined coming on here because of how I talk so fast. And um, with my deal with the anxiety, Chad, you know, I really, you know, I talk to you. I voice my concerns about how I may look on TV because I really do suffer from this, 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 uh, disease, but either way, yeah, I was there, and you know when I, you know, I forgot how many days Bubba had left, but he only had like eighty-seven left, man. And I seen him two days before he died, man. He bought some instant mashed potatoes from me. Me and Bubba, all the white guys, you know, we make wine and stuff. Even the ones who, you know, just everybody's got some hand in the wine game. Normally, you know what I mean. And uh, 
you know, he bought them in some tapes for me any which ways. What happened, like I told you, just so everybody knows. And uh, if anybody wants to dispute this, I mean, I don't know why you would. I was there. I'm telling you what happened. A pair of shoes come up missing out of Gar and Bubba Cell. Gar was Bubba Selly, ABT Gar. And uh, the pair of shoes that come up missing a couple of days ago, no one knew who did it. Now, it's it's been, you know, since people are dead and we can't get the whole story, it can only be pretty much assumed that it was the black guy that took those shoes. And everybody thinks that he got nervous thinking that, Bubba and Gar knew that he stole the shoes. So he waited on Bubba one morning coming back from Chow. And I just left the Chow Hall. And uh, I'm coming underneath the guard tower. And, uh, you know, we hear, you know, attention. This is an institutional emergency. Get on the ground. You will be shot. Take a knee. They run the gurneys out. One black, one white. It goes up. But before that, when Bubba was coming into the unit, you know, the black guy asked him a stupid question to get his attention for, for a quick reason. And uh, they said Bubba was just like, yeah, no, no, whatever, you know, blows him off. The guy stuck him one time in the side of the neck. OK, now that's not what killed him, Chad. I want this to be known. OK, that black guy from D.C. did not kill my dude. Those corrections officers in USP Pollock in 2007 killed, killed, killed Bubba Sparks. OK, I don't know if it's 06 or 07. My years get so, you know, that's part of what I got go through in my head. But they killed him, man, because he choked on his own blood. They came and got him. When they finally came and got him, okay, they left him up. They left him right, to, you know, where he could just choke on his own blood instead of turn him over. He's got his, I mean, you're, this is their medical staff, Chad. These are the people that get paychecks. They take a paycheck from that institution and they cash it and feed their children with it. And in their job description, you know, like I know, it says if a man gets stabbed in the neck trying to save his life, at least it's got to say that, right, Chad? I mean, they just didn't care. They just let him die. He just choked on his own blood. How do you choke on your own blood? I mean, while on a gurney with 16 medical people around you, they killed Bubba, bro. This family should have a lawsuit out of this world, man. That's crazy. Were you in the unit when that happened? No, I was coming on the yard. I was, okay, so Bubba was in like B2. I was in A3. So I'm coming on the yard. Uh, I'm coming through the, uh, there's a gate where C, B, and A meets under a guard tower. And I'm coming to A. That's when they hit the flat, you know, the deuces and all that, say that. And, uh, okay, so they one run, run one body by. It's a white guy. We get back to the unit. Now, what we find out later, this is, I'm going to go ahead and give you what I ended up finding out about this. They run the white guy by, or the, uh, yeah, Bubba, they run Bubba up there. No, they run the black guy first, I think. I'm not sure. Then when they run Bubba, Bubba's running beside, uh, or, I mean, Gar's running beside Bubba. And he's yelling down as they're going by the chow hall, I killed that fucking nigger, Bubba. I killed that fucking nigger. Now, that's all white. And I say that I'm not, you know, I'm just telling you what he said. So he he runs as he runs by all the blacks hear this. All the vice lords were the ones sitting closest. And all these vice lords who are supposed to be my brothers get up and just merge on the white side and start attacking the whites. Right now, I had just left. I can't help but think if I was sitting at that table with those guys who initiated that. When they looked at me, would they have just, I would have been the closest white guy, right? You know, I mean, it just like that day changed a lot. That's why, you know, you tell the people, you know, I'm, I'm not, my affiliation changed, you know what I'm saying, which I never thought it would. Either way, okay, so when I get back to the unit, uh, they're yelling lockdown, lockdown, but uh, the COs immediately start running to different units. Uh, we're looking out the window, they're running in B unit, they're running in C unit. So by now, everybody's getting worse, black on white. So this guy who ran, ran our decks are all the vice lords, all the peoples, all the everybody under the five to the little center thing. So we all go over there. He's like, what, what do y'all think we should do? You know, I'm like, it's don't involve us. We need to lock down. I'll never forget, man. One of the four corner hustlers looked at me. Who I thought was my guy from Chicago. A little motherfucker. I ain't gonna say his name, but he was like, uh, man, you're a white boy. They called me Casper. It's the only time they ever called me Casper in any joint I've ever been to, but they gave me that handle there and it just stuck. I couldn't shake it. I hated it, but I was the only white guy with a big black gang. So that's what it was. So uh, I says, we shouldn't do nothing. You know what I mean? Just, there's nothing to do. Just don't involve us. And he looked right at me, said, you're white, man. You better lock down. You ain't gonna get another chance. And I looked over at another big homie, Nuke. He's like, man, Casper, just lock down, bro. So I'm like, all right. But in the meantime, I hear them. They're about to go jump on my dude, Oki, who always used to give me these Louis L'Amour books and stuff, right? Old school dude down for life for meth. I mean, just a good dude, man. Uh, don't know his real name or not, but they're getting ready to go jump on him. And he's on the phone telling his people, hey, we're going to be locked down for a while, whatever. And that, that just was not going to happen. I immediately just was like, oh, hell no. I got right in between them. I said, no, hey, Oki, go to your cell and lock down right now, bro. Get off the phone, go. And stood in between these, my brothers and Oki. I said, no. You know, you want to jump on somebody, go jump on somebody who's about, you know, there was plenty of people that had the tattoos they were looking for, the real white guys that would have given the business in the unit. Go find one of those guys. This guy ain't got nothing to do with this stuff. He's calling it, you know. So I did that. And that ended up being big for me later on with the whites. You know what I mean? Because, of course, I'm a 
white kid in a black gang. You say it all the time on your show, how the whites look at that. And then your blacks look at that too. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, you got to be a certain kind of guy to get that, get that off. You know what I'm saying? With any respect and, and re- truly be respected as a man. You know what I mean? You know, it takes, you, you're going to be, you know, you're going to meet the, meet the bar. Well, listen, the bar at the end of the coming. day, at the end of the day, you're, you you're only doing a little bit of time. You're in a USP. Do you change your affiliation while you're there? No, I don't. I left that USP anyways right then. Instead of jumping Oki, they went and smashed out some other black dudes. So that's a race war. So three bodies dropped that day, two or three. Maybe it was just two, Bubba and the dude. Uh, there's a little, the little bit of uh, race war going on, uh, you know, a couple – incidents or whatever they lock us down for a couple months they write out all those vice lords right so they come to me the gang coordinator and everybody come to me and they're like we need to transfer you because they tell me what happened that in the chow hall it was my people that set it off they're like you're going to need to get transferred man because you're not going to be safe here all this i said listen please i've only got a few months left you know i got like nine or months or a year and a half left some small amount of number i'd have to look back and see but uh so I tell him I want to stay here. You know, I was like, you know, I, I got a good name with the whites. I'm I'm still cool with my car. You know, you rode most of those guys out anyway. Like, I'm good. So they made, I don't know if they made me sign something or not. I don't remember, but the decision was made that I would stay there. So we come off lockdown. I'll skip through all that. I leave the USP. I go home. I'm out for nine months, Chad. Well, first I'm out for 30 days. They lock me up for a shooting. I'm out nine days. I make the front page of the Mansfield News Journal. It says suspect in custody following a string of shootings, four shootings in three days. Man, I was just going at it, bro. I mean, I was just going at it. I was just, I was out. I hit a lick. Soon I come home on some big shit. I, so they charged me with tra- I, what stuck, what I ended up getting stuck with and uh, was uh, possession of a firearm, trafficking, uh, ecstasy, trafficking, cocaine, possession of cocaine, possession of crack, possession of ecstasy. They give me five years. What a paid lawyer. They give me five years. Not a great paid lawyer, just a regular paid lawyer. Um they give me five years, right? Well, the feds are like, well, you're still on a uh, federal supervision. We're going to give you two years on top of that once you're done with that. So I go to the state. Now I've got in the state, the four corner hustlers, like I was a, a known name for that. You know, I put guys on for my city. I was, I was always involved in anything under the five. Anybody that sees this, y'all know what's up. It's me, Tex. And, you know, y'all could, they was there with me. They know. So all them prisons I've been to, but uh, so that keeps on going, but I, I'm always into it with my own people, the the black guys, you know what I'm saying? The older black guys. I just could tell, like, you know, they don't like me. They don't think I belong. And a lot of that literature is that, see, I was always a four-corner hustler. Well, I didn't understand how they were with the vice lords, and we were always taught that we were separate from that on the streets, but coming to the joint, it's all, like, meshing. And in their statement of love, it says for you know, your skin is black, so is mine, this, that, and the third. So it was already, and I'd been through that situation at Pollock, you know what I mean, with the race riots. So it was all, and I was starting to get older. And, you know, I was just like, man, it just, it just still didn't sit right with me. You know what I mean? I finally came to where I was in a prison in Lebanon with my right hand man, my brother, who's AB. And I just, we had the best group of brothers. This is a real, this was a real brotherhood, man. We were in Lebanon, man. And it was, it was a real brotherhood. And I ended up going through the whole thing. I ended up dropping uh, my shit with these the five, I ended up banging out with those dudes, doing what they wanted me to do, fight with a couple of them to get out of their situation, whatever that was that I'd spent 20 years. I don't even know how many years in. And then I started probating, you know what I'm saying? And I became a brother, you know, it took a while, you know, and uh, I got my patch and then I just rose through the ranks. Okay. So I do that five years. And then at the end, they send me, I finished the state. I leave from the, me and the president, rest in peace, Redbone. He's dead now, but uh, we're Sally's. And they come and the feds come and pick me up. He'd done a lot of fed time to USPs and stuff. He's a legend, Roger Hall. He's a he's brand. He's a legend. And uh, so, anyways, bank robber, old school bank robber. Uh, they come and pick me up, man, and they take me. I, I'm knowing when I get back to, I'm thinking I'm going to a pen because I left from Pollock. So I'm knowing, you know, like I know, Chad. I left out of there as a on black time, pretty much. You know, a vice lord. I'm coming back with all these patches, rank patches, all this stuff of the Aryan brotherhood. You know what I'm saying? And I don't know where they're going to send me. You know what I mean? So all I know is I'm going to walk in here and I got two years to do, you know what I'm saying? So I'm like, man, I mean, just, you, you could imagine the feeling that I was feeling, but I knew this all coming up. You know, I, I knew it. I was hard headed, whatever. So I get my paper and it says FCI Gilmer. Get the hell out of here. Right. A FCI. Hey, that's a lottery ticket for me, baby. I might live after all, you know, I mean, let's go. So. That's where they sent me, FCI Gilmer. I was on that yard 21 days, 
And uh, they came and got all us ABs and uh, sent us to all different FCIs. There was some stuff that happened. I was the instigator. Uh, I was there with some ABTs and some other guys, and I felt like the yard. I, I was so turned up, bro. I just had a point to prove, especially being an AB. And once I got there and I seen, like, you know, it wasn't no big deal. Like, people were actually glad that I came home instead of, like, you know how whites are. Like, hey, you told on me when we were two years old in the sandbox. You know, that's your PSI. You're dead. You know, they're going to kill you, you know, or – like what happened with your dude dog? Didn't they like give him some stamps and tell him to put them here and then they weren't there or something? Like, you know how them dudes are, they're treacherous and they're snakes and they just want to kill their own. It's just horrible. Bro. The white dudes are definitely treacherous. So you're at Gilmore, you leave Gilmore. Where do you go after that? Well, they sent me back to Maryland, Cumberland, Maryland. They sent all of there's uh no, it was just it was only like three or four of us ABTs. I, I'm not ABT, but the guys there were ABT that they wrote out with this. They thought they were part of the trouble i was there 21 days so they ride one to leavenworth one to uh beckley meet uh, uh 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 cumberland so when i walk on the chart i'm just like i can't even believe it right you know cumberland's the sweetest place in the world they got carpet in the unit bro like it's but the only thing is there's all chomos and stuff like that and snitches and stuff so you're gonna have to walk the line with those guys like if you touch them, if you threaten them, anything, like, you're done. You're out of there. So you might as well. And we got with two years, you know, that's not an agenda I really wanted to push, you know. So I get there and I promise myself I'm not bringing no politics. I'm just going to get here and do my time. The SIS lady don't want to let me on the yard. You know, they keep me in the hole for a couple of days. She's like, I really don't know why they sent you here, you know. And I'm like, me neither. But, look, I haven't talked to my family in a minute. I've been in the hole for, like, four months. Like, I just got a few months left now pretty much, you know, a year or whatever it is. And some change, like. I give you my word. I'm going out here to just, just, you know, get on home, man. And that's what I did. You know, I ended up, uh, I ended up in my eyes doing a lot of good. That's where I met Noah Lanfrey, man. That guy I was telling you about slick, man. So, uh, anyways, you know, I think I did a lot of good things for those guys there. I was able to get us some tables and stuff like that. I still, you know, and, and like, okay, are you hip to, uh, What's his name, man? The guy, uh, his grandpa and his dad's Michael Douglas. Cameron Douglas is the kid's name. I was in, uh, I'm in FCI Cumberland with the kid, right? So all these white guys are on his nuts. Well, they put me in his unit. When I walk in, he gives me like a shirt and a coffee cup or something. So I'm like, damn, it's Cameron Douglas. Hey, that's cool. I, I have no idea, Chad. I don't know the story on that. So as it comes out, some of these serenials pull up on me and they're like, yo, Holmes, man, you're solid wood, bro. Yo, check this shit out. You know what I'm saying? They, and they, they let me see this shit. I'm thinking like, why haven't y'all killed this guy yet? He's been here for years. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And y'all have to, but uh, all right, cool. So that's all I needed to see. And I told bro, like, hey, you're, you know, we got a white TV and a white, hey, look, you can't come sit over here. I don't let the homosexual sit over here. I'm not going to let you sit over here. And uh, you can't sit at the table and you can't play handball on the white handball thing. You got to go over there with the with all friends. And do you know that whole prison almost bucked me, bro? Like literally stood up for this dude. I stood my ground and slick and a couple of, you know, actually good honky stood beside me, but they were really ready to say, you know, screw the fact that he snitched on a whole, all those guys. He's famous and has some money and his dad's on TV. And they're just, you know, that's how them guys was thinking in that FCI, bro. And it was just, it was sad, but I kicked him off the handball court and all that. So, so you're one of them dudes, man, that I talk about, People like you or yeah, people like you, you used to be like me. You talk about people like me to a certain extent, but I notice like the most of the guys you talk about, I know those kind of guys, right? They are normally motivated by what dope or a personal Thanks. agenda, right? A personal agenda. I push politics, Chad, sometimes, but anybody who truly knows me, they'll tell you like he's doing it for, it's not for nothing for myself. You know what I'm saying? I look at myself like, you know, you're a leader. I showed you the ticket that I got, you know, I, you, you know what they claim that I am or whatever, but you know, as, as, and that's how them guys sold me on that. They were like, you know, you're a leader amongst your people. You know what I mean? And, and you're pretty much devoted to this black gang. You know what I'm saying? This is so much bigger than a neighborhood or a gang. Like these are your people. And I always felt like I never had to put nobody else's people down to lift my own up. You know what I'm saying? And that's all I ever really wanted to do. But sometimes Chad, you know, you do have to push a, a little bit of politics and an agenda and shit. Like, so was I wrong? For going out there and uh telling oh boy hey you can't come on the handball you can't sit at the table you're a fucking rat you know was i wrong for that you know no. now now would i handle it like that these days these days you know i'm a uh, uh, i'm trying to change my life and all that so no i wouldn't and i don't i'm not proud i don't believe you i don't believe no, you. i wouldn't chad no i really wouldn't i really I, I i know you've only seen me just in this interview bro if you get to know me bro everybody will tell who knows me knows i used to be a super super turned up dude chad super turned bro okay. and i am so I, listen cool, i've like, been a, listen i've been in prison a long time i know that you're a turned up dude i can tell i knew a dude just like you one of your brothers named beast um ohio yeah. ab big kid yeah, tall beast. you know yeah. um he, he was I'm to him. 
he was about that business, bro, and he ended up getting into an issue with one of my homeboys from New York, and honestly, they were drinking, they were drinking buddies. Beast is a big boy, but the dude that he got into it, I'm a, his name was Joe. You told me. Joe knocked him out. You know what I mean? And I was just like, wow. That Joe, the best of us. Yeah, hey, yeah, it happens to UFC fighters all the time, right? Right, So yeah. I just believe that if you were on a yard, man, you'd probably politic a little bit. But, hey, politics are part of doing time, man. I'm not you know, faulting you for I that. Think, it's just I part of doing that, time. You know, oh, so I didn't get to finish the, the last. So, so, look, so that happens, right? I leave FCI Cumberland, bro. I was only out a couple. Uh, they told me I had no papers or nothing, right? So I was like, great. I go home. I go to Florida with my parents. I'm not doing any crime. I'm not selling drugs for the first time in my life. I'm, I'm, I'm going to church even, Chad. I mean, I'm doing good, man. All of a sudden, my door gets kicked in at 3 o'clock in the morning while we're back in Ohio uh, packing up stuff to take to Florida. They kick my door in, come in. You know, they found a pistol in the bedroom. I would always never give up my Second Amendment right. You know, they said they took it from me. I never gave it up. I don't carry firearms or nothing like that no more. But in my past, there was no way to catch me without one. I just, they've come in handy on multiple occasions. I just believe in my Second Amendment right. Every American should. But either which way. So they find the daggum gun and they said, you were on parole with the state of Ohio. You were supposed to report. But they, anyways, they had the wrong door when they kicked it. They went to my grandma's first long story store. I get out of that gun. It was in my dad's name or whatever. And he had uh, truly left that gun in that room or something. I don't know how that all happened. But either which way, they take me back to jail for seven months, right? So I come out of that and I'm mad now. They won't let me leave Ohio and all my family's going to Florida. So I immediately started selling dope. I immediately take the dope money and start my own business called Legit Lawn Care and General Contractors. Get me a couple zero turns, a few guys that know how to drive them, a truck and a trailer. Now I'm doing passing out my business cards. We got flex fit hats, roll, rock and rolling. But I'm selling heroin and crack. And I'm now I'm starting to use heroin, sniff heroin too at the time. This is really happening to me, Chad. You know, this is, this is, and this is real and raw. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't even know this about me. Like, what text? Yeah, yeah that, that, that really happened, you know? And uh, either which way, I was out seven months. One night, this guy called the police on me, told him I had a gun uh, in the back of a Holiday Inn, man. They come. I had uh, it's all I pled guilty to it now. So I had this 357 in my pants the whole time. They searched me four or five times. Finally, they asked me which car is mine. I tell them because I didn't think nothing's in it. It's my black Volvo right there. They searched it, found 15 grams of heroin. The guy had put in there. It was my dope. He was holding it. He put it in there and called the police, told him I had a gun. It was any which ways. They So they're booking me into the county jail with this 357. In my, in my boxer briefs. So I pull it out, wipe it off, throw it in the backseat of the cruiser. They don't find it till the next day, right? So all that happened anyways. They charge, uh, while I'm sitting in the county, they come with two counts of trafficking heroin. So I'm sitting in there like, well, I'm screwed. You know, I'm going to get a federal charge for the gun. I'm going to get all these trafficking charges. At the end of the day, I walk away with another five-year sentence. They send me to a level three. I'm thinking everything's cool. I'm there for one week. They come in, shut the whole unit down. Briley, Briley, get me, cuff me up, take me straight to the hole bring a case manager in there, tell me that due to my actions on the street, they have are transferring me to Lucasville, Ohio, the Supermax, level four in me. I never don't cut a, catch a shot. I don't catch a shot, nothing. They said that I was extorting correction officers on the street to take packs into the prison up here. It was a lie, bro. I never did that, Chad. I had a problem with some COs out here, and, uh, you know, there was never a police report made on those guys. And so why, if, if this is true, why didn't you make a police report? You're a corrections officer. If I pulled a gun on you and extorted you, you should have called the cops. You didn't. You're a liar. It never happened. So they send me to the Supermax and keep me slammed down for five years. I came home nine months ago or eight months ago, Chad. I got out May 6th or something like that. There it is. There it is. That's the reason why you're the way you are right now. You sat That's in a cell for on. five years. What is it like? See, now we're going to get into a couple things, man. We've been on here a little while, but what's it like sitting in a cell for five years, man? Well, if your viewers want to know, I, I, I got a real easy way they can find out. You know, uh, they could go into the smallest bathroom or closet in their house and, and they can close the door. You know, I suggest getting some instant coffee. And, uh, you know, a couple roll ups because that's pretty much what it is. It's a bathroom. I mean, it's, it's, you're, you live in a bathroom. That's your life. That's your that's your kitchen. That's your closet. That's your living room. That's your bedroom. That's your garage. That's your everything. You live in a five by nine. Dude, I literally would walk three paces from my bed to my toilet and have to turn around, and walk back for five years, five straight years. You know what I'm saying? Well, actually, it's like four years and eight months because for the first couple of months, I was going through orientation. It was still 23 and one, you know, and then they got me to level three. I was waiting to get to go to a regular block. I'm like, oh, yeah, I bought a cell phone. Man, this is great. Yeah. It's a sad, Boom. sad, sad life, man. I want to ask man, you. At the, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I no, want to ask. Sorry, Jack, go ahead. I want to ask you a little bit about 
you know, you switch gangs, you become an Aryan Brotherhood of Ohio, right? You're an AB member out of Ohio. A lot of them dudes get busy. You felt like it was a brotherhood. Did you felt like that? Did you feel like that was your family, man? Like these are your dudes? For one brief moment, man. Now I don't even say brief because I still felt like that once I hit the feds and I met some of them ABT dudes. I did get along with them. I did. I, I agree with everything you say about a lot of the stuff about the gang members, bro. They are horrible, and I I try to keep that out. You know, I am one of the good ones, man. You know what I'm saying? I'm sure anybody will tell you that. I'm sure Dinky probably would have told you he was. I personally know that he wasn't. But either which way, you know, uh, it's. It, 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 it's 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 it doesn't define who I am anymore. You know, I don't want that to be what what I am and who I you know, I want it just to be what I wasn't. But yeah, that did feel like my family, man. Until the until the end after I seen like these guys know I'm going home and now I done took all these years because we gotta you spread the ticket. You know, we get into this shit, they claim I'm the leader, send me back. I'm getting ready to get out. You know, I had a chance twice to get out of the, the the step down you know i'd been good set in the box now they put me in a step down and every time i would come out something would pop off you know with another gang or some crap like that or in the last instance me and my own people got into it i ended up getting into it with my own people i got a five-page ticket i'll send it to you and let you see how they did me bro these guys all told told them i had cell phones told them to see it, this this thing i was doing with a certain thing i mean te- this everything you know and then try to switch everything around on me oh texas a texas a check-in texas a snitch and this and that and you know anybody who knows me or knows anything that really happened here they know that's not true but you know that's these are supposed to be my brothers these are guys i would kill for put my life on the line with six months six days six minutes left you know what i mean and it took a lot all that for them guys to betray me and really my best friend had i read the letter where he okayed they were, I was going to get killed. You know, they wanted my spot, you know, the, how the heads get hit. That's what happens to the head. You get hit by your own. So I intercepted the letter and, and my right hand man, bro, my enforcer, man, uh, I just seen his picture tonight. It fucked me up. He's out on the streets right now, man. That shit fucked me up looking at his face. But, uh, yeah, he sold me up the Creek, bro. He sold me up the Creek and they, that, you know, had I made this one move, I just got jammed up by a gate. Had I been on the other side of that gate, bro, I might not be talking to you right now, bro. And all over a position, you know, it's just crazy, bro. It's just sad. But you said, are those dudes my family? Them dudes ain't my family no more, man. Them dudes ain't my family. My wife is my family. You know, my mama and my grandma and all my family in Texarkana and South Arkansas, that's my family. You know what I'm saying? Mansfield, Ohio, you know, this. that's my family. People who really care about me and love me. And, and, and they accept me for who I am now with the struggles that I'm facing and my challenges. And they know and they see what I'm doing is everything that I can to just be somebody that's going to be out here with them and be able to hug them and spend Christmases and stuff. Because, you know, like I know, Chad, man, you know, you sit in there all the years after year after year. And, you know, my mom always used to tell me, like, look up at the moon tonight, bub. I'll be looking at the moon. You know what I mean? And, and, and you know, that's as close as you get to your people when you're all the way around the world. You know what I mean? And it's just it's a hard it's a, it's a hard pill to swallow. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, bro. And I tell you what, you know. <sighs> It's just not worth it, man. If I'd have known what I know now, bro, I'd, I would just, I'd be so much better off. And I wish, I wish I would have just known. It's, the dude said it on your show. It's as simple as just going to work for 40 hours every week, figure out, you know what I mean? That's all you got to do. And you can get a, you know, I got a truck. I got, you know, things are tough and tight right now because I ain't been working, but it's all picking back up. It's just about being patient in those times when you feel like, man, I got to make a move. I got to make it happen. You know, my truck payment's a couple days late right now. Just be still, be calm. You know, God's going to provide. Things are going to happen legally. I don't have to make that illegal move no more. You know what I mean? Well, I'm so, glad. And, and, and my, they accept me for that. I'm glad that you don't. And let me tell you this, right? Because this is it, man. You know, I don't always know what the moral of the story is, man, until we start to get ready to close. And the moral of the story for you is this. You were a high-ranking Ohio Aryan Brotherhood member. Dudes wanted your position. The dudes that you're hanging out with, the dudes that you're eating with. We're willing to kill you over nonsense, bro. That's what your gang had for you. The four corner hustlers. Dude, tell you, man, you're a white boy. At the end of the day, man, that's what you were. These are supposed to be your dudes, your bros, man. But the same dudes that are smiling with you and laughing with you, eating with you, will be the same dudes that will try to kill you, man. Right or wrong? You know, you're you're dead right. You're dead right, you know. You know gang got you. Right hold on, here. hold on, because I'm not done yet. Your gang got you five years. Locked away in a hole. They say, this dude's a dangerous dude. A, B. We're going to stick him in a bathroom for the next five years and let him pace back and forth. And for brothers that haven't been in there or, or even women that are watching, if you haven't spent 30 days locked in a room, you can never imagine what it's like to spend six months or a year walking back and forth, pacing, waiting to get a shower three times a week, 
Or when you go to bed hungry at night, they put this little bullshit ass tray in there. They slide the tray in there and it's liver and you don't eat liver. So tonight you're going to bed hungry, man. Tonight you're going to drink a big, big glass of water, maybe three or four of them. And you're going to lay down and your stomach's going to hurt because you drank so much water, but you were trying to chase the pain away, the hunger pains. Dude, that's what your gang gets you, man. That gang life, we're too old for that shit, man. We're supposed to be fathers and leaders and husbands. And I don't know how, <clears throat> I would never ever in my life put a gang before my wife, before my kids. And them gangs require that shit in a lot of them gangs. Like that's your life. This is who you are. And I'm sure you heard Lumpy on here the other day, the DWB kid. Lumpy's a big dude, man. Lumpy was a dangerous dude. He was a violent dude. He was a DWB. But man, that, that man came home and really changed his life. He was one dude that people probably thought, this dude will never change his life, man. That's me. Put the gang aside. You've been home how long? Nine months? Uh, I got out. Yeah, it's like eight months. Hey, man, did you see my dogs, though? That's another thing keeping me out. Those are my children. I got American extra XL bullies, man. And uh, it's it's. It's they're 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 like my they're they're like my kids, man. I mean, it's they're it's constantly it's constantly giving me something that I got to be responsible for, and and like how you, you know you got your kids, but what's crazy is like I really feel like if something happens to me and I'm not here to take care of these dogs, like those are my like I would lose it. Like if I can't be here to make sure they're these babies are all right, you know, like so I could just imagine how you feel, you know, with the. With Let me tell you something about about a dog, right? I like animals more than people. I've said that numerous times on my show. When I came home, I was connected to a dog, man. That he was, he was a rescue, and me and that dog became real, real close. And he actually ate something and almost died. And I paid nine thousand dollars out of my pocket, bro, literally oh, to, to save the dog's happened. life. So listen, listen to what I'm, listen to what I'm telling you. And I've been Thank separated from that dog. Like he's on my, he's my screensaver. I'm not. I can't ever see the dog again. But that dog loved me more than the person that was raising that dog for the last three years, man. And, and me and that dog, we don't see each other no more. And the last time I seen him, I hadn't seen him in a week. And he was crying, bro. And it, 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 honestly, Why don't you it broke my heart. I, I do. We, I got two dogs. My We got two Sharpays. Oh. But that oh, was the dog. Man. That was the pit. That pit bull was the dog that I loved with all my heart, bro. And I, I, I hey, I'm not afraid to say it, man. I love that dog more than anything, bro. Not more than my wife and my kids, but I love that dog, man. Right. So I can yeah, feel these two you. dogs, they're they're something else, man. You know, they 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 changed my life, man. They keep me in my they keep me motivated, man. They're they're beautiful, man. But anyways, man, I I do want to say, you know, uh that I never thought that that PTSD and anxiety was real, right? I didn't even think it was a real thing. I did think PTSD was real for like Afghan soldiers, Vietnam soldiers, people who had bombs go off by them, that type of stuff. I could understand these guys. But when people would tell me I got PTSD or even tell me that I had PTSD, I'd be like, man, you don't even know what PTSD is. Or in my anxiety, I kind of thought maybe I might have something there. But after those five years and all this happened and I started really like looking at myself and 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 monitor myself, like seeing how fast I talk, seeing how I'm always talking, you know, the way I can't and how I get like, like, I don't have a problem going to Walmart. I thought, well, I was just telling my girl how, yeah, these guys say they have problems going to Walmart. So she's like, babe, think about the last time you were in Walmart where you didn't have a problem like where you almost didn't get into a fight or you didn't get stressed, I had to leave, you know, and that's why I'm working with these dogs. I want to get them certified to have service animals. And that be, you know, part of my calling card, you know, with these training, training, these bullies, these American bullies, XLs. I'm going to recommend that to dudes, man. Dudes coming home from prison that been through the shit that we've been through, man. Yeah, man. Get a dog, man. And I believe you ever watch pit bulls and parolees. I used to love that show in prison. That's what I want to do, man. I want to do something like that. I just don't like I'm so slow with Facebook and I just got a Facebook a week ago or two weeks ago. Like, I just don't know how to do this stuff, Chad, but I'm learning a little bit. But I would love to be involved in something like that, man. I recommend the dudes coming home from prison. You know what it's like to be in jail, man. You know what it's like for no one to care about you. That You know, they got these dogs, man. Rescue, man. Rescue a dog, man. Take a dog yeah. home, man, and, and, and show him love and compassion, man. And he's going to love you, man. And he, it does help with you know, some of the stuff that we've been through, the PTSD and, you know, just all of that stuff, dude. It, it, sometimes you find comfort in animals, bro, and there's no problem with that. I'm going to, I'm going to get ready to close the show, but before I do, man, you know, you were in, you were in the life, man. You were all the way in, put in work. You've done bad things to people, man. You call bad shots on people. You might've called some good ones, but I'm sure you called some bad ones too. And we're men. We can admit it. I've done it. I'm sure you've done yeah. it. I've done it. 
Yeah, I've done it, man. But at, at the end of the day, man, I'm glad that you're changing your life. You got a girl that you met, and you know you, you got your own house, and you two seem like you got a good thing going on. And I encourage you to continue to do that. But being that you're on a different road now, and you ain't been on it long, but you're on it, what message would you give to your younger self, man? Man, I'll tell him I got a crystal ball, man. You ought to give me 50 bucks right now for this, man, because I got a crystal ball, and I'm going to go ahead and give you a, a free reading, son. I'm going to give you a free reading. I'm going to tell you, and this ain't me. This is anybody in that life. I'm going to tell you where you're going to be two years from now, four years from now, six years from now, 10 years from now. I'll give you a play-by-play -play your whole life if you're lucky enough to make those intervals, to make those milestones, because it's going to be prison, 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 or you're going to wind up dead, man, and you're going to be miserable. You know, I'm broke as I've ever been right now, Chad, and I'm finally, truly, for once, starting to see that I can be happy. I'm not going to say I'm fully happy and that everything, but I do see it, 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 you know, it's a possibility now, and I know that it's no amount of money that's going to make that happen. You know what I mean? And that's what I would tell my younger self or any other younger guy, man. If you go out there and you put some work in and just learn a trade, man, you will be paid in full, man, just a simple trade, bro, and just apply yourself just a little bit. You know what I mean? And what I would really tell my younger self is stop trying to prove yourself to these nothing ass people. You're 10 times tougher. You're 10 times the man any of them will ever be. Worry about yourself. And that's what these young guys need to do. Really stop caring about how tough, you know, that I look or how tough that people think you are. It doesn't matter, man. It's not going to pay your bills at the end of the day. You know, all them girls that you might get while you got the tough guy, trust me, you know, none of them girls are going to stand beside you through a prison bit. None of them girls are going to stand beside you when you have an emotional PTSD breakdown, anxiety, when you're in Walmart about the flex. And, you know, none of them people are going to be there with you when you're at your worst, you know. So focus on you, man, and worry about yourself. No doubt, man. I appreciate you, man, coming on the show, and I encourage you, man. Appreciate you if, having me, man. If you're not working right now, bro, there's work out there. Go out there and get it, man. You're a young Dude, man. I got these business cards made up, man. I've got like 250 of them. I'll pass them out constantly. I, I got a truck, you know, a little trailer. I'm trying to haul people to help people move and any odd jobs, uh, you know, because I never really learned a bunch of skill sets, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm very – but I have, though. I have learned a lot, you know, a little bit of stuff. And, uh, man, I'm, I'm – I'm, I'm getting calls. You know what I mean? It's just slow. I'm just beginning. You know what I mean? And I'm trying to do it that way because unfortunately right now, if I go out and get on paper with the thing, I would lose my uh, insurance and everything. I got to get some medical stuff taken care of first, but yeah, it's all around the corner. Like I said, it's all about being patient, man. Just sitting there. You know, let me say one more thing, Chad, this old school dude told me this one time, and this is serious business right here, man. He said, youngster, you're not giving yourself a chance. He said, perfect attendance, man. You got to have perfect attendance. You got to be there. You have to, you have to make yourself available. If you're not out there, you know, you might walk down the road and bump into a million dollar lottery ticket one day. He said, you know what you're going to bump into in here? The toilet. That's it. Nothing good can happen. You're not present. You're not available for that to happen to you. You're not available for some millionaire to look at you and say, hey, I like that guy. Hey, man, you want a job? Matter of fact, here's just a million dollars. Now, would that actually happen? Maybe not. But you're making it's available to happen to you out here. You're present. Perfect attendance. You need to be here every day. You know what I'm saying? Once you take yourself away and you're absent in prison. You're no longer available. You know, your attendance is you know, you're perfect attendance, man. I want to be here every day. Well, well look, man, I appreciate you. I'm going to close the show, Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button. Share the video with respect. Until tomorrow, we're out.